welcome to What's New with AWS. I'm Jeff Barr. Before we jump into our story, I want to thank you as always for the continued feedback and the likes. I read all the feedback and it really means a lot to me. Got a great story for you and then three awesome launches. All right, so a couple years ago, we were planning a trip to Peru. Uh, Peru happens to be my wife Carmen's home country. We've been there many times over the last 40 years or so. This trip was gonna be just a little bit different. We, we took along some friends and then some friends of friends. As part of our planning, we of course decided to, we were gonna go see Machu Picchu, one of the most amazing tourist sites and tourist attractions in, in all of South America. We, got, we, we caught up with, with everybody in Lima and made our plans to proceed along to Cusco. Now, a little bit about our friends of friends. Great folks. We'd never actually met them before. Uh, the guy was actually a runner, one of these people that when he's standing still, he's kind of got all this just energy and almost like this, this coiled spring just ready to, to unwind. His, his partner, on the ha other hand, she, she was a little unsteady on her feet and actually walked, walked with a cane, but wonderful folks and it was really awesome to, to meet them make our plans in Lima, and then off we go to Cusco. We fly from Lima to Cusco. Now, one interesting thing about Cusco is it's actually 11,000 feet above sea level. So you, you get there and you need to spend really a, a day or so just letting your body acclimate, building up some additional red blood cells to carry some additional oxygen around. Great time to just relax and get to know the, the, the city a little bit. Now, I have a little bit of a, a fear of heights from time to time, maybe a little bit more of actually a fear of gravity and what gravity plus height can actually do. I, I suspect if I was in, in, in space, in, in zero gravity, I, I might not have that, that, that fear of heights. So we, we have a, a good time in Cusco and we're ready to head on to Machu Picchu. A little bit involved to get there. So after we've done our flight, we've acclimated, we take a train to the, the base of Machu Picchu to this cool little town called Aguas Calientes. From there, we take a bus up through the, the, the kind of the side of the base of a mountain through all these switchbacks. I think there's like 18 or 19 switchbacks along the way. We're just about to head into Machu Picchu. And then Carmen says, oh, I forgot to almost tell you, but right next to Machu Picchu is this unbelievably awesome mountain called Huayna Picchu and it's got some really really cool views and we should climb it and just enjoy Machu Picchu from the the Inca point of view. My fear of heights kicks in and I'm, I'm not super psyched about this but Carmen and I are the the host in the group so I've got to go along and everybody says yeah let's go this is going to be really awesome let's climb Huayna Picchu and I'm thinking okay sure all right I'll I'll do this. Now we started our day really early and they allow just 400 people to, to climb Huayna Picchu. They let 200 people in on the, the 7 a.m. admission and then another 200 at, at 10 a.m. Now, I, I'm looking at this huge mountain, but I'm also thinking, well, it's a tourist attraction, so it must be safe, right? Any, any, any tourist should be able to do it. And you kind of look at the, the variety of folks that are about to make this climb and think this, this, should, this should be totally reasonable, totally, totally safe. I'm, I'm still really, really apprehensive but my arm's been twisted and, and up we go. It, it's really not easy going, but I, I do my best to keep my, my fear to myself because I'm the, the co-leader of the, the group and supposed to be setting the, the, the good example. Our, our runner friend, well, that spring unwinds and just kind of boing and off he goes at, at full speed. He's gonna show everybody and he's gonna just run up way to Pichu and back, leaves, leaves his, his wife with, with the rest of the, of the group. One thing I should tell you is that Machu Picchu is that was actually carved out of, of a jungle. And so the, the, the footpath and the, the rocks are all just still really wet, really slippery from the, the early morning fog. S super interesting to look at, but also really slippery and a, a little tiny bit scary. As we do this, we're, we're mostly kind of like looking up and looking ahead, but everything you can see is just terra firma. It's it's dirt and rocks and trees and plants and artifacts. So you're, you're kind of like really reassured by the fact you can see all this great physical stuff. Not a whole lot of, of open air to, to see. We're, we're climbing up at a, at a pretty, pretty good clip. I I'm, I'm remain apprehensive, but doing okay. We, we get to this one point and there's a lot of, we're suddenly like taking these really big steps to go really, really high. And I realize I'm actually 
almost hyperextending my my knees to 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 um to to get up up these steps and thinking hmm this is this is a little bit weird and I I'm thinking way ahead and thinking this is going to be really interesting to to come back down these these really really tall steps as we're ascending we got these just awesome views of of Machu Picchu we're we're still climbing but our runner friend well he's he's summited and he's on the way back down he he just passes us by says hi to his wife and continues on down to to the base. After a lot of exertion, a lot of energy, uh, a lot of misgivings, we I finally get to the summit, super, super relieved, take the a commemorative photo. There's a great sign up there. Carmen and I took a photo together to prove that we'd actually climbed Buena Pichu. I'm thinking we, we did it. I, I've climbed it. I've conquered my fear. A little bit of a sigh of relief. This all turns out to be a bit of a false victory, and the real adventure is just still ahead of us. We still have to descend. We still got to actually get down there in, in one piece. Now, the, the thing I've learned about climbing, and I haven't done a ton of it, but the things I've learned from the, the local hikes around, around Seattle is the, the climb is actually often a bit easier. The ascent is easier than the, the descent. You can stop at any point you want as you're climbing and just kind of lock yourself into position. When you're coming down, you've got this gravity assist. And in software terms, to me, that's more of a bug than a feature. Because if, if you're not careful, you don't manage your, your speed and your momentum, gravity takes over and you, you lose control. So I'm, I'm being really, really careful. We're, we're descending and we get to this point and I, we're, we're now back at those, those steps I told you about earlier. And they, they didn't look all that scary on the, the way up. It was just, we're just kind of pushing our way up, up these stairs. Not, not a really big deal. Standing at the top, and I, I really look at them from this brand new vantage point. And it is nothing but these really steep stairs just cut out of this rock face. Now, I, I'm in marketing and I've participated in, in any number of naming exercises for AWS services over the years. But you want to talk about really bad marketing? It turns out, and I only learned this afterward, these stairs, the, the name that you find online, it's called the Stairs of Death. Great, great. Like, who, who came up with that? And luckily, there was no sign that said, warning, Stairs of Death ahead. That would probably turn most people, people uh, away, right? Anyway, why are they the Stairs of Death? Well, a normal set of stairs has a 45% grade. So it goes up and goes in at, at the same proportion. So it's just basically just a diagonal of, of a square. The stairs of death, on the other hand, are far steeper because they just had this mountain to carve them out of. The stairs of death are really steep. They are at a 60% grade. Now, kind of thinking the, this, it's, I'm, I'm thinking, well, what was the stairs of death? Was this like just a really bad translation from the original Quechua language that the Incas used? Or was this a nickname? I, I don't actually know, but, but whatever way it is, they, I'm at the top, freedom is at the bottom, and I've got to get through the, the stairs of death. Oh, oh, I actually forgot to tell you the, the worst part. There's several dozen of, of these really, really tall stairs. At the bottom is a landing, maybe, maybe three or four feet square. And you're supposed to just turn right and keep on going. If you don't turn right, there's just literally just a void. There's, there's, there's no railing. There's no sign. There, there's no barricade. It's 100% authentic the way the Incas left it in the 1500s. It is just open, empty air space. I'm at the top of the stairs. I'm so worried about gravity. I'm thinking if if I if I like lose control and I tumble down, I'm just I I am just like in the air, and uh, that that's it. The funny thing is, no one else actually notices this. Everybody else is just walking down these stairs like it's just a, a regular set of staircase. Um, the the children, the senior citizens, our our friend with the cane, everybody else in the group, they're just like. They're just totally, totally fine. Um, I'm at the top. I, I'm actually frozen and people are, are just kind of squeezing past me. And I'm, I'm really, really worried. They're actually going to going to knock me off. A at a certain point, the, the flow of people stops. And at first, I'm like, oh, great. No more people coming. And then I realize um, I'm, the, I'm the last one that I was the last of the 200. I am all of the low all alone. This is the end of the line. I'm scared to death. I'm kind of hungry. 
I'm actually pretty weak from the, the altitude. And I'm thinking I'm probably going to die within like five minutes or so. I really, this, this really is what I'm thinking. And I, I realized I've, there's probably two different ways I could die. And I'm thinking, well, I, I either go down the stairs, I'm going to slip, I'm going to roll off that edge. I get a beautiful view on the way down, but I'm going to die like when I, when I hit the bottom and I'll, I'll be in the jungle. Or I can just stay right up there and ultimately it's going to get dark and really cold and I will just die of, of exposure up there. So it's either the fast death or the, the slow death, but either way, that's kind of kind of the end. I, I think about my family, but then I also think like, okay, I, I didn't share my accounts and passwords with anybody, which dumb thought, but that's what you think in those, those kind of situations. I, I'm up there for a while. And Carmen comes like almost bounding up the steps. She's been doing this like a couple, a couple times a, a decade for, for her entire life. So she's, she's totally, totally fearless in this and, and just about every other situation, actually. She sees me, she asks me what's wrong. And I just say, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I'm, I'm literally just stuck here. I, I can't do this. And I'm like really hungry too. She looks at me for a bit and she says, well, if you make it down okay, I'll buy you a steak. Like it so sounds pretty good, right? And she says, you can do this. You got to set a good example for the group and just don't be such a big baby about this. Then because she's the group leader, she leaves me there and returns to the group. Not, not a whole lot of help, but then I think, you know, when our kids were babies, well, we taught them how to go down the stairs just backward. And we would set them down on the stairs on their belly and they'd very, very carefully move their arms and legs and get down those steps just level by level. That's what I'm going to do. I turn around. I get on all fours. No one's watching, but I don't care if they are or not at this point. And my world just shrinks down. It's my hands. It's my feet. And it's the couple of steps that I'm on. I'm going to do this. And I look down. I find a place to put one foot. I take a really, really deep breath. I gingerly lift my foot. I push, position it on the next step, set it down, test. It's still solid. Shift my weight a bit. I'm still alive. Do the same. My other hand, still alive. I'm breathing. I'm, I'm almost hyperventilating at this point just to make sure that I'm fully oxygenated. I'm thinking that steak that was promised, but I think that, remember what she said, she said, if you make it, you get a steak. So she's not got 100% confidence in me either, but I'm gonna do this. Another foot, another hand, another foot, another hand. I'm going pretty slowly and I'm worried that the sun is gonna set before I get to that landing, but I, I, I make it. I finally, after who knows how long, half an hour, an hour, two hours, it could have been, I finally get to that little landing. I, I don't even look over the edge. I, I take that turn. I'm actually alive. Scamper away from, from, the, from, from the, the, the cliff, verify that it was as scary from far away as it actually looked from the, the top. And I've, um, it's easy going from there. Get down to the, 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 the base of the trail, the base of Wayne Picchu. Rejoin the group. They're kind of curious as to why it took me so long. And I was like, hey, you know, I got, I got stuck on those stairs. No, no, nothing wrong with admitting that. We re regroup a bit. We spend the rest of the morning, the early afternoon, seeing all of Machu Picchu. Um, highly recommended, by the way. Make sure to see Machu Picchu at some point in your life. We wrap up our time there. We hop on the, the train back to Cusco. And we find the best steak restaurant in all of Cusco. I have an awesome steak. It never tasted so good. I quickly get on my phone actually while we're waiting for the, the, the dinner to show up. Turns out people actually have fallen off the, the, the stairway of death. So I was, I was kind of right to, to be afraid. Um, my lesson is that sometimes you do things once and that's plenty. And sometimes doing things once is maybe even more than enough. And that's my story for you today. And now let's get into the launches. First up, the AWS Key Management Service helps you to create and manage cryptographic keys and to use them across a whole bunch of different AWS services and also directly in your own applications. It's secure, it's resilient, and it uses hardware security modules to store your keys. The big news is we now support multi-region keys. You can create them once and then you can replicate them to other AWS regions. 
This is really cool because it's going to make it easier for you to move encrypted data between AWS regions. It's going to actually simplify your disaster recovery and your backup if you use encrypted backups, as you should. You can also use it with client-side libraries, things like the AWS Encryption SDK, the S3 Encryption Client, and also the DynamoDB Encryption Client. To learn more about this, you can read the What's New. The next launch is a big addition to EC2 billing. Now, let's think back, way back to before we launched EC2. Back then, if you wanted server access, you had to either buy hardware or you had to make really long-term commitments, months or sometimes even years. When we launched EC2, you could get an hour of compute time. That was a huge revolution for its time. It opened up just a ton of really cool new use cases. Back in 2017, we moved to a, a per second billing model if you were using EC2 with Linux and also for your EBS volumes. The big news today, we now have per second billing if you're using EC2 for, to host Windows Server or to host SQL Server. There's a one minute minimum, and then there's per second billing after that. Now, I know you can think about this as, as a money saving feature, and it probably will, but I want you to actually think about this as ways to enable some really new use cases. Maybe things related to dev and test, or data processing, or different kinds of analytics. To learn more about this, you can read the what's new. And finally, some big news for AWS Backup. So AWS Backup lets you centralize and automate your data protection across a whole bunch of different AWS services. This includes your EC2 instances, EBS volumes, your RDS databases, DynamoDB tables, your EFS file systems, and more. The new feature, I think this is really awesome and I think you're gonna like it a lot, is called Crash Consistent Backup. What this means is that when you do a backup, you get the same point in time effectively of all the EBS volumes attached to your EC2 instance. This means that you better preserve the state of your application. The cool thing, this is built in. You're already benefiting from it if you're using AWS Backup. To learn more, you can read the what's new. And that's all the launches I got for you today. I hope you enjoyed my story and all the launches. Love your comments, keep those coming. Click through, like, subscribe, leave a comment of your own. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.